I'm Jace Taylor, um, I work at Sharp Research Labs here in Oxford and I will be talking about um, memory. Our next contestant is Jason Tyler. Jason's a research scientist. He's an engineer masquerading as a scientist. He designs algorithms for consumer electronics products. So I think that means he's responsible for all your computers and phones and all the wonderful things like that. And he used to sing in a swing band. So please give a very warm welcome to Jason Taylor. It might be a bit ambitious in three minutes, but you and I are going to do some science right now. We're going to do an experiment. I want you to remember the following five words. Don't write them down or confer or anything. Ready? Tree, mirror, floor, Mars, electrode. Got it? Okay. According to the 1968 atkinson schifrin model, there are three main stages to human memory. First is the sensory register, where stimuli like vision and hearing actually enter your mind in the first place. That's like the in-tray on your desk. Second is short-term memory, where that information is actually processed and handled. That's like the desktop itself with your pen and your calculator and your notepad. And finally is your long-term memory. That's where that information is processed, compressed, cross-referenced and filed away on the bookshelf or discarded into the bin. The problem is, each of those three stages can let you down. You might swear blind that you heard a gunshot and actually it was a car misfiring. You might walk from one room to the next and completely forget what you went in for. Right? Or, when you're remembering the halcyon memory of your first kiss, if you can remember it at all, you might then file it away again slightly differently, maybe forgetting that it was actually raining or that you were a rubbish kisser. <laughs> Two weeks ago, the European Brain Prize was awarded to three British scientists, Tim Bliss, Graham Conwidge and Richard Morris, whose work for the first time observed the mechanism at work in creating long-term memories. Effectively, Every time two brain nerve cells, called neurons, fire at the same time, the electrochemical connection between them, the synapse, gets permanently stronger. It's like a motorway junction spontaneously growing an extra lane whenever there's a burst of traffic through both roads at the same time. But that same mechanism means that when you recall a memory, you can go back and change those synapses again and alter the memory. Every time you take a book down from that bookshelf, it's liable to have a page torn out, or be written on, or be put back in upside down or in the wrong place. So how many of those words have you remembered? Anyone got all five? Yeah, you should have been listening to me better. But here's the rub. Of those ones you did remember, I suspect you remember them correctly, right? You didn't recall trunk instead of tree. Short-term memory is good for about four or five things for about 30 seconds unprompted. But the things you do retain tend to be accurate. Long-term memory is kind of the other way around. It might have the equivalent of 28 million gigabytes of permanent long-term storage, but every time you load a memory from it, it can be altered. So, next time you're sitting an exam or riding a bike, or even competing in a science communication competition during Oxford Brain Awareness Week, <laughs> just remember that, um, <laughs> that it's a triumph that you're remembering anything correctly at all. Thank you. It's kind of obvious answers. The, the obvious ones to get out of the way are exercise, healthy living, plenty of sleep, that kind of thing. And I'm afraid they're obvious for a reason, because they do work. But perhaps slightly more subtle ones are things like repetition, practice. I mean, you know, we're all told at school, don't cram before the exam, short term, as we now know, is rubbish, by the way. But it really is repetition. It's accessing those memories over and over again that builds those long-term um, synapse strengths. It's called long-term potentiation, and it is a permanent effect. So accessing all of those memories over and over again is what really builds the strength of those memories that <coughs> last a long time, long, unless, of course, there are medical <coughs> memories. Okay, well, what kind of potential does this have for people who suffer from things like Alzheimer's or dementia? Great potential is the answer. Um, <clears throat> the, the most recent research tends to suggest that the reason Alzheimer's sufferers lose memories 
is they, they're not actually losing the memories themselves. What they're losing is they're, they're forgetting how to remember them. It's like having a garden shed in the corner of your garden, but never going to it. Eventually, the path's going to grow over, and you're never going to to find it again. But it is still there. So the trick, as a result of that research, seems to be, well, maybe it's about rebuilding those paths or building new ones. So there's um, electric therapy, where very low levels of, of uh, electric current are passed through specific parts of the brain. And this has been carried out, I think, I think in humans most recently, but certainly in mice, which tend to be a good model for this kind of process, that shows that uh, both creation and recollection of memories, because those are the two key things where it can fail. You can either fail to write the memory properly and then fail to read it again later. But both of those processes are massively improved when this low-level um, electrical current is passed through your brain. The one downside that the one, one patient reported, though, was that um, it gave him a bit of a headache and a bit of a scratchy head afterwards. But in return for treating long-term memory loss, it's got to be a great change. And uh, we talk about people having good, and some people have good memories, some people have bad mm. memories. Is there scientific evidence to show that that is actually true, or can we all train to become as good as the next best person with the best memory? The answer is it seems to be a bit of both. So there are lots of ways that you can train your memory to be better, and anybody can do them. The individuality comes into it when um, you find that specific uh, mechanisms and approaches work better for other people. And the exact scientific basis for that is, is kind of a little bit shaky and a bit complicated and, and fairly new. But for example, um, memory champions who compete in this sort of nationally or globally, they tend to use um, association strategies. So they'll, they'll visualise a route through a, a maze or a building, and they, you know, they'll, then I'll wander into the garden and that reminds me of plants, and then I wander into the shed and that reminds me of a spade. And they build these these kind of tricks and mnemonics and things like that. So there is there is uh, you know a collection of things that everyone can do to improve your memory, but some will work better for others than other people. Thank you.